Name is Chloe Northrup. Oh dear, let me mute my computer. OK, is that better? All right, so I'm Chloe Northrup. I'm the department chair for the history department here at Connect Campus, and we're so excited that you joined us today for this talk by Dr. Scott Langston. from Indian boarding schools that we're hosting here at the Tejita Fulkerson Library at the Trinity River campus. And we've had some really dynamic programming for this throughout the month of February. And we're just so excited that you're joining us either here physically or if you're streaming with us today, we welcome you. And please feel free to put in the chat any questions that you might have for the question and answers. And if you're here in person, please enjoy some of the delicious pizza and cookies and drinks that we have in the bag. And definitely make sure to check in for that extra credit both online and in person. So today, Dr. Scott Langston has been closely involved in Texas Christian University's Native American and Indigenous Peoples Initiative since its inception in 2015 and continues to serve since 2020 as the university's inaugural Native American Nations and Communities Liaison. He has recently retired after a career of 30 years teaching at various institutions, including nearly 20 years at TCU in religious studies and American history. He has worked with a number of Native American communities and groups in Texas, Oklahoma, and Nebraska, including the Wichita and affiliated tribes, Alabama Coshawta tribes of Texas, Chickasaw Nations, Indigenous Institutes of the Americas, American Indian Heritage Day in Texas, and MMIW Texas Rematriate, and we hosted one of the leaders of that last week in our panel. In 2022, TCU awarded him its Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Award for his work with Native American and Indigenous communities. In 2023, TCU's Race and Reconciliation Initiative made him the co-recipient of its Plume Award for his work in establishing and sustaining TCU's Native American and Indigenous Peoples Initiative. Langston is past president of the Southern Jewish Historical Society, current board member of the Texas Jewish Historical Society, and current editor for the primary sources section of the journal Southern Jewish History. In 2017, Southern Jewish Historical Society awarded him the Samuel Proctor Award for Outstanding Career Scholarship in Southern Jewish History. Let us welcome Dr. Langston here today. Thank you very much. Um, I'm really honored to be here and um, humbled to be here to talk with you, um, but especially to talk with you about this topic. It's a really important topic, but it's also um, a sacred topic. It's not just an academic topic. This is, um, these are sacred experiences of native peoples and communities. And I wanna treat this topic with that kind of um, sacredness rather than just another academic topic for that. Um, I, I should tell you though, that I am not Native American. Uh, for that matter, I'm not Jewish. You might have thought that from my background, neither one of those. Um, I'm just a white guy and I was born here in Fort Worth, but then grew up in Southeast Texas in what was a small town. It's not small anymore. Houston's about to gobble it up. I grew up in Conroe, Texas, but when I grew up there, Houston was a long way away and Conroe was very small. So extraordinarily conservative environment that I grew up in, conservative re religiously, politically, and in all ways. Um, nobody back then in my hometown would have ever guessed that I would be standing in front of you today and talking to you about Native American boarding schools. It's been a long journey uh, for me to, to get to this point. I fortunately uh, have had many Native people who have graciously taught me and I have learned from them and listened and still have much to learn from them. And the whole reason why I begin this topic with this introduction of myself is because Native peoples have taught me that I need to position myself in relationship to um, the topic that I'm about to speak on. So 
you have to take what I'm going to say with a grain of salt because I'm not speaking as a native person or a member of a native community uh, who has experienced this. I'm rather speaking as a non-native, a white person. Um, if you want to use the terms colonizer, uh, that's w where I come from. Uh, that was the history of my family. You know, most of my family were poor people. They weren't powerful people, but they sure benefited from the policies that powerful people put in place that hurt Native American peoples. Um, so that's the background that I come from that I'm, I'm going to be speaking from. I, I want to begin um, our topic with just a few session acknowledgements. You know, sometimes you want to give a land acknowledgement. I'm not going to give a formal land acknowledgement, but just some points to kind of put in context uh, some of the remarks that uh, we'll be talking about and considering. Uh, one thing is that Native Americans are sovereign nations. This is very important. This is really what sets Native Americans apart from every other group within the United States. They're first and foremost a national or political entity rather than a race or a culture. There are racial and cultural aspects, but first and foremost, they are nations who are sovereign and who are in a government to government relationship with the United States. They, the United States Constitution, Supreme Court, other courts you know, have all recognized this. These are sovereign nations. In addition to that, um, Native peoples have been here a lot longer than non-Native peoples of any group. Um, thousands of years. And in fact, as we've gathered today, I'm very mindful that just a few blocks from here, um, I think it was on the corner of Lexington and Weatherford Street streets, a few years ago, uh, there was a construction progress and they uncovered remains of an indigenous woman who it was determined she was in her 30s and the date was approximately, I think, 790 to 990 AD or CE, over a thousand years ago. Indigenous peoples were here at least over a thousand years ago. We're the newcomers to the place. And so I think that is important to shape the way that we think about what we are doing. We are currently located on the lands of the Wichita and affiliated tribes. So that's the Wichita, the Waco, the Kichai, the Tawakani tribes. This, these were their homelands. So before Europeans, before Americans came here, the Wichita and affiliated tribes were here and they are still in existence. Their government still exists. They were forcibly removed from Texas. They're headquartered in Oklahoma now, but they are still here. We are on their lands. I was born in Fort Worth. Um, but really, I, I think maybe what I should say is that I was born in the, on the Wichita affiliated tribal homelands because that's what it was before it was Fort Worth. So we want to respect them. Um, Dallas Fort Worth Metroplex was founded on an exterminating war against Native Americans carried out by the Republic of Texas. Now that that's a hard statement to hear. And I want to say, you know, before we get very far into this, a lot of what we're going to talk about today is hard to hear. Um, it from a non-native perspective, it, it's it's tough to hear. Um, it can be challenging. It's easy to become defensive, um, but these are realities. From a native perspective, uh, a lot of what we're going to talk about today is painful. And, you know, I apologize for that. And I want to try to handle that very sensitively. But the bottom line is Dallas Fort Worth Metroplex began as a result of the Republic of Texas carrying out, and I'm using the words of President Maribo B. Lamar, he called it an exterminating war against all the native peoples of Texas. He mentioned, he, he inaugurated that in late 1838, and then over the next several years, he attempted to carry that out, and the Republic of Texas carried it out beyond him. But were it not um, 
for that exterminating warfare, Dallas-Fort Worth would not have originated. And in fact, where it hits even closer to home is that on May the 24th, 1841, General Edward H. Tarrant, for whom Tarrant County is named, and Captain John B. Denton, for who the city and county of Denton are named, led a group of Texas militia to attack native peoples who were living along Village Creek, which if you know where Lake Arlington uh, Golf Course is, as well as the lake, uh, most people think that the battle site is probably underneath Lake Arlington now. But if you go to, I think, the seventh tee, there is a small plaque, historical plaque there. Uh, Tarrant attacked them. Native peoples realized that um, their living places had been discovered and they were no longer safe, so they left the area. Within six months, white settlers were moving in, including John Neely Bryant, the so-called founder of Dallas, were moving in, dividing up the land, taking it, and Dallas-Fort Worth began to grow. So that's why I, I connect the beginning of Dallas-Fort Worth with this exterminating warfare. I also want to um, dedicate this, uh, our conversation today to Elsie Gilpin Morris. She was an elder of the Omaha tribe. I knew her for several years and I'm close with the family. Um, she as a child was sent to the U.S. Indian School in Genoa, Nebraska. Um, I think Miss Morris, she died in her 90s a few years ago. Uh, I, I never heard her talk negatively about her time in the school, uh, but certainly, you know, she she was a part of the effort that those who had formed the school were engaging in with regard to Native peoples there. I really respect this lady a lot and um, she valued education highly, even though she she'd never had a higher degree. She always had a wage earning job, but um, she was a really smart lady and I respect her a lot. I just want to remember her and her role at Genoa, Nebraska. Now, as we go through this session, I would love for y'all to, if you have questions or comments or anything, please, you know, raise your hand, feel free. Let's have a conversation. We can have time at the end for a formal question and answer, but I don't mind at all if you jump in. That's way more interesting than just listening to me talk for, you know, on and on and on. Ask my former students. I can put you to sleep. Yeah, no problem. I can especially put you to sleep at lunchtime. So please feel free to jump in here. And I do want to reiterate that a lot of what we're going to talk about today is, is hard to hear. It's a difficult conversation and can be very painful. And um, it can be hard to process. So if at any point, you know, you're having trouble processing this as time goes on, um, you know, the whole month is hard to process with the exhibit and what we have heard. I do encourage you to reach out and get help uh, from people you respect, whether it's counselors or elders or whatever, because it, it can be tough to deal with. Um, but we have to ask these tough questions. So what I want to try to do is rather than take a ground level look at the boarding schools, which we heard from last week's panel. We've seen it in the exhibit. I think probably some of the other panels um, talked about experiences of people in boarding schools. I want to back off and look at the big picture, you know, of why boarding schools? What, what was the purpose behind it? How do they fit into this bigger picture? We'll talk some about the ground level, but really the kind of the overall big picture. But then I ultimately want to ask the question, of why does it matter? Not does it matter? It does matter. But why does it matter? Why don't we just say this is just um, a sad experience in American history and you know we move on from it? Um, I think it's more than that. And so we'll talk some about that at, at the end of our discussion today. So when we look at boarding schools in their broader context, I think the starting place to understand what happened, try to grasp them, is that boarding schools ultimately were tools of American colonization. 
So I have given sort of a stripped down definition of colonization. I'm not saying this is the best definition ever given. You know, I, I don't know if I would fight to the death over this definition, but this is kind of the bottom line. When you strip it all down, why were Europeans coming here and later on Americans? Why the, were they so interested in this place, this region? And the bottom line of that is it's to take and control the lands and resources on which Native Americans had been living for thousands of years, not simply as individuals, but as sovereign nations. That's the bottom line of it. It was to get those lands and resources and profit from it. But one big problem with that is that you had native peoples living here for all of these millennia who weren't just saying, oh, come in, take our lands. You know, we're not using it anyhow. They're not, they weren't saying that. They resisted it. Just like we would resist it if, say, down on the shores of Galveston, some foreign nation rolled up and started unloading its military onto our shores, we would fight back. Native peoples resisted that. And so one of the big problems and one of the conclusions that um, the United States and their European predecessors came to is that the way to get those lands and resources is to destroy Native Americans. Physically, culturally, socially, always, identity wise, always. And that's the reason for the boarding schools, ultimately, yes. Yeah, this is an excellent question. Um, I think it's a very complicated answer, you know, so it's probably all of that. But what I would say is um, there were individuals and groups who did come seeking religious freedom for themselves, but not for anybody else. Okay, that's what they sure was not religious freedom for Native Americans. And it sure was not religious freedom for any other Christians that varied from how they were practicing. But the nations who allowed them to come and who encouraged them to come, they were here ultimately for the lands and resources. That's why you establish colonies. Colonies are to send resources back to the mother country, first and foremost. People can come for their own reasons, but in the big picture, they're working on behalf of the nation who's come to get the lands and resources. At least that's how I see it, yeah. Um, now, in this process, uh, the United States has used a lot of tools and weapons to destroy Native Americans, and I've just listed a few of them here. Christianity, for sure is one of the major weapons used by the United States to destroy Native Americans through forced conversion to Christianity and also making it illegal for Native peoples to practice their spiritual traditions. We don't hear that a lot in the narrative that we're told about the United States and religious freedom and all that, but for Native Americans, there was no religious freedom. And American Christians, um, authorized, justified, and carried out the destruction of Native peoples. I'm not talking about people, you know, wackos on the fringe doing this. This was mainstream Christianity. That's a whole nother story that, you know, we could talk about. Um, I taught a whole course on that when back in the day, uh, which was only just a few months ago, um, about that um, experience there. But Christianity, and I think Christ American Christianity has yet to really deal with that heritage that it has. Democracy. Um, democracy is great. You know, I'm I'm going to vote and all that stuff. I like democracy. I don't want to live anyplace else. But again, the United States used the processes of democracy to take away 
the rights of native peoples and to destroy them. The military, you know, we probably all know that from what little bit we get um, in school. The courts and legal systems frequently are used to take away native rights and to destroy native peoples. Economic systems, language, representations of native people, but also non-native people, popular culture, all of these are weapons that are used in the destruction, either physically or culturally, identity-wise, of native peoples, all of which could be long conversation there, but but we have to move on. So just to reiterate and to make clear, you know, how do we understand the boarding schools? They were part of a larger historical and ongoing effort. That's very important to recognize. Colonization, we oftentimes talk about it as happening in the past. It did happen in the past. It is continuing to happen today. Colonization, I personally, I think, when we talk about the great social justice issues that we face as a nation, you, know, you can think of them, racial, gender, whatever they are. Colonization deserves a pl an equal place beside every one of those bigger issues because it is an ongoing process. Looks a little different, but it's ongoing. But the bottom line is to take and control these lands and resources. And you do that by destroying Native Americans as Native Americans. And if you think about the process here, you might look at it. There's the boarding schools whose sole purpose is to destroy everything about Native peoples. Those children were having scrubbed out of them hairstyles, clothing styles, food ways, religion, uh, family and kinship ways, governmental ways, you name it, all of that at the boarding schools, they, they were put there to have all of that removed and in its place, everything that is part of American culture, Christian American culture was being put on them. The only thing that they could not change was the color of their skin and that is another issue as well. So why, are, why is the country doing this? It's to get the land and resources. You have to remove native peoples to get those lands. And it's easy to dogpile uh, the state, federal, local governments. They should be dogpiled for what they're doing. But we also have to remember that um, the reason why those governments are doing it is because individuals like my ancestors were clamoring for that land. They wanted that land to make farms on and raise their families and you know do whatever it is that they're doing. But to get that land, you have to remove the Native Americans, which then gives birth to some of these policies. So boarding schools are expressions of much larger attitudes and goals. Now, another context to understand boarding schools is um, how they relate to the broader edu educational process in the United States. Before boarding schools, Europeans and Americans were concerned about educating Native American children in the ways of Western Christian um, thinking. The primary way they did that was through missions. And missions, Christian, Christianity and American culture were virtually considered to be one in the same. If you become a Christian, you become American. There's not really much of a difference there. So these mission schools were teaching Native children not just about Christianity, but how to live as an American or before that a European. And what's the so-called proper way to do that? So missions were central in that. And the American government um, worked in lockstep with the denominations to have these mission schools there. In 1819, the federal government began funding, setting aside money to fund um, specific institutions or efforts uh, to educate Native children in terms of agriculture, although I would say Native people have been doing agriculture for thousands of years. 
they knew how to do that. They just didn't do it like the way Americans did it, Europeans did it, reading, writing, arithmetic, those types of things. Then um, there were, yes. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, um, I don't know. And I, I'm i not familiar, like when I go online and look at the inflation calculators, I don't think it goes that far back, but yeah. Are there, okay. That, yeah, that would be great if you can look that up there. Thank you. Um, day schools on reservations. So there, there were more and more of these. And what those, a day school is like what a lot of us grew up with. Uh, you get up in the morning, you go to school, you're there during the day, and then you go home in the evening. That would be what a day school is considered. Do you find it? Not a lot. And by the way, most, but now that was the first time. You know, and then it increases as it goes along. And most of this money the government um, sent to what they called the benevolent societies, which were primarily church societies. Now, boarding schools, there were some boarding schools that were on the reservations. So the native children would go and live in those boarding schools, but um, they wouldn't go home in the evening, but they would live there for a while, but it was close enough that their families could go for a visit. And maybe during the summer they could go home for that. So you did have that, but then the real period that the exhibit and what we're talking about today begins, these are what are called off-reservation manual labor boarding schools. 1879, Richard Henry Pratt begins the first one at Carlisle Indian School. The key thing was that they were off the reservation, sometimes hundreds of miles away. And we'll see there's a specific reason for that. Manual labor, that sounds like a terrible term, right? I, I mean, I, I used to tell my students, you wouldn't want to come to Texas Christian Manual Labor University. Who wants to do that? That sounds awful. But what that really meant is it was a vocational school. It was teaching vocations like agriculture, blacksmithing, you know, those kinds of things. So you, you have the rise of this starting in the 1870s, and then if you look at it collectively, between 1819 and 1969, the federal government operated or supported 408 boarding schools. That doesn't mean they were all operating at the same time, but over that time period, that's a lot of boarding schools to be either operating or supporting. But then there were other, like church schools, there's a lot of education going on. Beginning in the 1940s, the United States began uh, terminating its relationships with Native American tribes. In fact, it's called the period of termination. And what that meant is even though uh, the United States was bound by treaties to these tribes, it began throwing off its responsibilities and saying, uh, we're no longer doing that anymore. So part of that was starting to shut down the boarding schools. And uh, the, coming out of World War II and with the development of the Cold War coming on, uh, the United States had a lot of debt. It was looking way to, to shed um, expenses and one way is get rid of the boarding schools because they're very expensive to operate. But what happened then is native children were pushed into public and private schools who were still teaching a very similar curriculum, but now uh, public and private institutions are are bearing the brunt of the expense of that rather than the federal government. But also this begins another very dark chapter in American history, which is the adoption of Native American children by non-Native children there. So they're pushing that responsibility onto individual families. And then by the 1970s, things begin to get a little bit better with a self-determination era where basically um, Native tribes are being given more input into the conversation. You have the rise of tribal colleges and universities, um, and things are better, but there's, you know, there's still a long way to go with that. And I would just call attention that um, the Department of the Interior started in 2021 an investigation into the 
uh, federal boarding schools and they came out with the first report in 2022 and that's still ongoing. So there's a lot of information that's being um, dredged up from that. Another context to think about the boarding schools in is this, that Americans, um, especially in the 19th century, 20th century, but even today, um, you can see people talk about that societies would develop uh, from lower states to higher states. So they're moving from savage societies to barbaric societies to civilized societies. And, you know, people would have different ideas about this, but you can imagine that savage societies were those that were Native American, that emphasized um, community rather than individualism, that had a much closer connection with what we call nature, um, that were from American perspectives that were um, idolatrous or polytheistic or animistic kinds of societies. The highest level society, as you might guess, were societies that practice Christianity, democracy, capitalism, ardent individualism. And so the notion was that you can advance as a society up to this level. So the idea, though, becomes that's informing the boarding schools is that, you know, name a tribe, Kiowa, Choctaw, say whatever, name the tribe. They're savage. All of their ways are savage. They begin to advance. You know, they'll make some progress as they're giving up some of their ways, but they haven't completely got there. But the ultimate goal is to make them a Christian American, not as a group, but as individuals, because the group, the nation, the tribe um, has to be erased so that the United States can take the whole thing. And so the goal is to turn the nation or the tribe into a group of individual Christian American citizens. That's what the boarding schools uh, were undergirded by. Now, I want to, uh, going forward here, I want to look at sort of uh, some of the main players' own words because I think they're far more compelling than what my summation of them would be. Uh, and in doing that, um, I, I hope it can bring out some of the other contexts to these boarding schools. So Richard Henry Pratt, you know, he's like the originator of this whole idea of the off-reservation manual labor boarding schools. Uh, he has a really interesting article that if we have time, we'll look at more closely in a few minutes called The Advantage of Mingling Indians with Whites. And he references this idea that's att often attributed to General Philip Sheridan in, in 1869, but there's a lot of question about whether Sheridan actually originated the idea. But Sheridan um, talked supposedly that the only good Indian is a dead Indian. I'm sure you've all heard that statement. It's a very common sentiment in 19th century America. Um, and Pratt argues that you know, he agrees with that sentiment, sentiment, but only to a point. And this is the famous saying, kill the Indian and save the man. That's where Pratt gets it. When Pratt makes that statement, though, he is... I mean, it's hard to, to see this, but he's kind of pushing back against some of the larger notions among Americans that what do you do with Indian people? You should just kill them, literally kill them, massacre them. Pratt's saying, no, we shouldn't massacre them, but we do have to kill everything Indian about them in order to civilize them and make them into true Americans. So hopefully from our perspective, we can look at that and go, oh, that's a terrible idea. But at his time, he was pushing back against what maybe a majority of Americans were in support of in terms of killing, physically killing Indian peoples. But Pratt didn't come up with this idea on his own of kill the Indian and save the man. You can see it in different forms. Uh, here's one, 1779, where this toast was made by American soldiers. Civilization or death to all American savages. So if you look back up here, civilization is save the man. Kill the Indian is death to all American savages. The idea being Native Americans are not allowed to exist in American society as Native Americans. 
And if they resist that assimilation, you kill them. But you cannot allow them to exist as uh, native peoples culturally, socially, any other ways. So the boarding schools are set up to scrub all of that out of them. I'm going to skip by this for time wise, but it was just a point to point out that Sheridan probably didn't make up the kill the Indian um, saying yes. almost statement for how many yeah. people agreed with him and how hard was it to convince those that didn't does that make sense yeah it does so i don't know i, I can't give you a number on that but I, I think in a lot of ways pratt is preaching to the choir when he makes that statement because it the it was to a group of progressives by 19th century standards um and as we, we'll see i hope um, they were quite critical of how the United States had treated Native Americans, but they, their, their point was there's a better way to do it, which is to civilize them. We have to completely immerse them in American culture rather than segregate them. That was their term, segregate them on reservations. So I think most of his audience would have agreed with him outside of that is a much bigger task. Yeah. Yes. I just thought it might be interesting if you were to indicate that as well into it because it's so glossed over. So, uh, yeah, Albuquerque. Yeah. yeah. In 1881, it was. It's open. just as a side. Individual stories of survivance is our actual our talk next Tuesday as well about an individual boarding school and stories from that as well. So, um, if Dr. Langston wants to talk about this, but also if you'd like to hear more. Join us next Tuesday for the talk from Davina Two Bears, Dr. Two Bears as well. So sorry. Yeah, so I'm going to defer to that talk, but I, I do want to say, first of all, um, I'm really sorry about your relatives experiences there. Um, and you're exactly right, it was horrific. And you can imagine as a child, you know, cutting off your hair, which in many native cultures that you only cut your hair when you're in mourning something bad has happened these children probably were not speaking english and they're taken in usually by train and they get off the train and they walk in and one of the first things is that cutting of the hair how are they processing that you know it's horrific um, but it's part of this bigger process that americans justified so anyhow, I'll, I'll defer till next week on that. Um, again, for time's sake, I'm going to move through this very quickly, but notice this comes from an editorial which was given in a prominent uh, magazine from the day. It was a prominent uh, Christian minister who was the editor of this magazine there. But notice the criticism. You know, we've tried all of these things with Indians, and he admits we cheated them. We drove them from their homes. We taught them to be drunkards, encouraged them to be idle, broke our treaties. He's saying all this, kind of get, getting to your question about how people accepted this. He's very critical of the United States. But then the way that he's thinking is, you know, our choice is to either exterminate them or to educate them, but look at this, to try to make decent people out of them. You see the presupposition behind that is that native peoples as native peoples are not decent people. Therefore, we have to make them in to decent people. So you have a national project to try to make that transformation through education there. And that's what the boarding schools were trying to do. 
General Nelson Miles in that same edition said very similar things, but you notice I, I underline this. He's saying when we educate native peoples, that's how we can talk with them, explain them the divine law. This is Christianity here. We can tell them this is what God wants us to do with you. Also the laws of the state, teach them the responsibility of doing wrong. The assumption is that native peoples um, won't take responsibility for what Americans consider to be wrong actions. And then how to become self-supporting and acquire property. Native peoples knew how to be self-supporting and they had property. But from an American perspective, it wasn't in a capitalistic way, so it didn't count. So what education is designed to do is to exert this American will and control over Native peoples by reformulating really everything about them. This is really, I think, a very sad statement because it comes from a student at Carlisle. And that student says, it is a nice way to get education from the whites because we learn something about the white man's way so to make ourselves useful men and women. So that student had been taught that as native as a Native American, I assume it was a Kiowa because that's the name he had, as a Kiowa, he was not useful. He could only be useful if he became a Christian American. If the Indians did not send their children to school, they could do nothing, but now their children are worth something. So now think about growing up in that kind of environment where you are told you are worth nothing unless you become like me, the white Christian American. We all like to be at school and work. We love God and pray to him to make us better. Again, that idea of we're bad, we need to be made better. I've been at school about six years now trying to learn the God's way, how to make myself strong and useful. This is part of that bigger impact of scrubbing out Native American identity from ge multiple generations of Native Americans. And in anticipation of the question, why does it matter that we understand Native American boarding schools? I'll just throw out right here is because we've had multiple generations of Native peoples who have been told and taught that being Native is bad, demonic, inferior, savage, barbaric, and the only way you can be useful is to become a Christian American. That makes a difference when you have people today living with that kind of reality in their lives. But I'm getting ahead, we got, we got, we'll, we'll talk more about that in a minute. So what happened in the 1870s is there began to be this realization that if the United States is gonna be successful in taking all Native American lands and resources by the destruction of Native Americans, it needs to focus on the children. That doesn't mean that children weren't subjected to this kind of education before they were, but basically there begins to be this um, occurring sense among policymakers that we need to give up on the adults. And really what they're saying, the adults are resisting and we cannot overcome their resistance, which is a great story of resilience, those strong adults who resist it. So they're saying, let's do an end run around that and focus on the children, because children aren't set in their ways. And we can get those children, isolate those children, teach them a different identity in a different way, and then those children will think like we think, and we got it over generations. And so um, here is another very offensive expression of that. Um, but notice the chance is with the little Indians there. So th those boarding schools that started out by Pratt and then multiplied in the years, you know, well into the mid 20th century, 
those boarding schools were a designed focus to take Native American children away from their families and their communities and their societies and immerse them in white American society in order to make that transformation so that the lands and resources could be taken. I'm going to skip this on the uh, man, the manual labor thing was an educational philosophy <clears throat> that had to do with a curriculum that combined the teaching of basic academic subjects like reading and writing with manual labor. So the idea would be that you learn by doing manual labor, you learn these vocations. Um, that was the philosophy that was implemented. This was also implemented among uh, whites and blacks and other groups within the United States. It wasn't just focused on Native Americans, but that's what was applied in these boarding schools. This is really an interesting statement, I think. So this comes from the Commissioner of Indian Affairs. Oh, I gotta hurry. Um, so the, in the pecking order, there's the President of the United States, then the Secretary of the Interior, then the Commissioner of Indian Affairs. He's the guy that's in charge of implementing all of these policies. And you notice what he says here. In no other manner and by no other means in my judgment can our Indian population be so speedily and permanently reclaimed from the barbarism, idolatry, and savage life. Notice barbarism, savage. Remember what we talked about earlier, what those things meant. You know, he's thinking in these ways. But look at idolatry. This is a Christian term. This is straight out of Christianity. If you don't worship the Christian God, you are an idolater. And in Christianity, in the Bible, what happens to idolaters? You kill them. One of the major texts that American Christians use was the book of Exodus and the book of Joshua, the story of the Israelites coming out of slavery, going to the promised land to become the people of God. But, you know, if you're familiar with the story, do you remember what the Israelites were told about when you enter into the promised land? What do you do to the people who are living there? You kill them. Men, women, babies, children. Why do you kill them? Because they're idolaters. That is a loaded term in Christian history. So when it comes out, when you see it, it has all of these connotations around it about this is how you treat Native peoples. And uh, um, among a lot of Christians, they would call Native Americans red Canaanites. So the Canaanites are the people in the biblical story who get killed by the Israelites. Native Americans were red Canaanites. So he's, he's calling upon this background, but no way that they're going to be reclaimed again you know, they're worthless, we've got to reclaim them, as by the educational and missionary operations of the Christian people of our country. This government official realizes he has to have Christians on board in this process. And then he says, this kind of teaching will educate them to be sober, industrious, self-reliant, respect the rights of others. Now, if you look at that last sentence, it is filled with stereotypes and misinformation. But this is a guy who makes policy and he's making policy on the basis of Christian assumptions and stereotypes and misinformation. We're gonna teach them to be sober. So that could mean one of two things. That could mean not drunk. And if that's what he means by that, he's using one of the biggest Native American stereotypes you know, recent studies have shown Native peoples don't have higher rates of alcoholism than other groups. But he could also mean um, serious. You know, somebody who's very sober is a very serious person. Well, the assumption is either Native Americans are drunkards or Native Americans are not serious, which is not true. Industrious, that means they work. The assumption is Native American peoples are lazy. Another Native American stereotype. But you know what? You don't live and survive on this continent for thousands of years if you're lazy. 
the lazy people died. <laughs> Industrious people, sophisticated people, they survived. That's Native Americans. Self-reliant, the assumption is Native peoples are dependent. They're not self-reliant. But again, for thousands of years, Native people were self-reliant. The United States came in with its policies and cut the legs out from underneath their economies and their abilities to be self-reliant and made them dependent and now uses that as an excuse to blame them for that. And then respect the rights of others. Now let's think about that. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to assume Hiram Price was not a stupid person. So why would he argue that Native Americans don't respect the rights of others? Well, I'm, I'm going to guess, oh man, that was bad. I'm going to guess that, could you put that in? <laughs> Thank you. I'm just kind of falling apart here. Maybe that's the signal to shut it down. Um, I'm going to guess that He's looking at how Native peoples were attacking Americans, and that happened. There were atrocities that happened. But what the question he doesn't ask is, why are Native peoples attacking Americans? And I think the simple answer to that is because those Americans were invading their countries with the purpose of taking their lands and resources and destroying their families and cultures and societies. So what would you do if that happened to you? You would fight back. But he is interpreting that fighting back to protect their lifestyles as being not respecting the rights of others. It's this misinformation that surrounds the whole boarding school process, which is just really, um, damaging, destructive. And I would add this, and then I'm going to skip a bunch of stuff to get to the questions there because of time. But here's Hiram Price again. And, you know, I'm not picking on Hiram Price. These are typical attitudes. The influence of men and women whose lives are devoted to the uplifting of the degraded and ignorant. He's talking about Christian people, Christian missionaries cannot be measured, measured by dollars and cents. Moreover, the very fact that he represents a great religious denomination, that a Christian community is his constituency, and that the funds which come into his hands have been consecrated by prayer and self-denial, gives to a man in his work a moral force and momentum which government patronage, patronage does not impart. That's a really important statement because he is saying up front, as a government, we can't really justify what we're doing to Native peoples. Coming in to a sovereign nation and trying to overthrow it and kill them and taking their children and try to transform them into us. I, I would hope if somebody threw that as out as a plan today for the United States, somebody would go, wait, you know, that, that's not a good thing to do. But what he is saying is that when we have the voices and the support and the work of Christian people in America to pull this off, that brings a kind of morality to it. I put that in quote marks. Because then we can talk about this is what God wants us to do. This is the truth. This is freedom. You can cloak it in those kinds of terms and it becomes more acceptable to people. And that really shows you what I think is going on in broader American policy of which the boarding schools were an expression of that. Okay, all this stuff, I'm gonna click right by. It pains me to go, it's good stuff. <laughs> but I wanna get, to this. So why does it matter? Well, as we talked about, the impact of the boarding schools, as well as all these other American policies, are still being felt. And what I mean by that is this ongoing human trauma in a lot of Native communities, not all of them, but in many of them, 
this notion of intergenerational trauma, which arose, I believe, out of the study of descendants from the uh, Holocaust during World War II. This notion that when you have a, an overwhelming trauma that's inflicted upon a group of people, that that trauma is passed down through the generations. So that people today who maybe did not literally live through the boarding schools are still experiencing the trauma of it because their parents and grandparents and other family members are trying to come to terms with this and are reacting in ways that are not really healthy ways. They're reacting out of trauma. Uh, Native communities in many places are still struggling with this. The ongoing political trauma is there's still this struggle between the American government and the governments of Native tribes all over this country. I think it's gotten better than what it was in the 19th century, but that's a pretty low bar to measure it by. Colonization is still occurring in the United States, and I would use the term systemic colonization. And what I mean by that is that we live in systems and processes that are founded upon the values and goals of colonization, which is taking Native American lands and resources and destroying Native Americans so that it becomes a part of the systems. And most of us, I don't think, are even aware that by participating in these systems and processes, we're actually helping further the goals and values of colonization. It's that prevalent um, throughout our society. It informs how we teach and understand and talk about Native peoples, their histories, their cultures, societies. So think about it very quickly. When you hear the term Native Americans, what word pops into your mind? Or what image pops into your mind? You don't have to say it, but just think about what, you know, what comes to your mind. Is it these kinds of words? Primitive, savage, ignorant, dependent, past, so on. Or is it these kinds of words? Sophisticated, technological. I'm telling you, the STEM leaders on this continent have always been Native Americans. They've created some of the most technologically sophisticated artifacts and processes and architecture anywhere. Native Americans did that. Strong, smart, contemporary, relevant. Your native teachings, native cultures can speak to a lot of the issues that we are currently dealing with today, and they have something to bring to the table if we listen. Sovereign, capable, legitimate, innovators. Well, see, the boarding schools were teaching this kind of stuff. As broader American society was, and still does, through Native American mascots, and we have this embedded in schools in the Metroplex who feel it is their right to use Native Americans as mascots. That's an expression of colonization that's ongoing. Can you imagine Native students, how they feel in those contexts, what they're being taught? It's important that we teach this. It also informs how we teach the history and narrative of the United States. So this is not very scholarly, but the U.S. has done good. It has. There's good stuff that has come from the United States. We should admit that. The U.S. has done bad. It has. We should not be afraid to understand and teach the complete narrative. I mean, it kind of in a, a dumb sort of way, I can make the argument that I'm the greatest person that ever existed in humanity if all I do is emphasize everything and exaggerate everything good about me, we need that complete picture. I'll go by that. And then just a couple other things. We talked about this earlier. 
people who are making decisions and developing policies, if they are doing that on the basis of stereotypes, misinformation, unbridled self-interest, that's extraordinarily damaging to people. And for Native peoples, it matters to understand the boarding school experience as to how stereotypes, misinformation, and self-interest can damage a community. And then finally, um, for those of us who have good intentions, the boarding school is a big warning because I think a lot of those people in the boarding schools thought they were doing something good. They had good intentions, but in reality, they were being extraordinarily destructive to peoples. Uh, and, you know, the point of that is if you have good intentions, but they're being carried out with colonized attitudes and goals and in the systems and the processes, you're still achieving the same colonized outcome or working for that. And it's, it's not enough for us just to uncover what happened in the boarding schools if those colonized attitudes are still functioning as they are. So I'll leave it with this. This is a group of girls at Chinoa Indian School, and I invite you to look at their faces. You know, I often have this picture on my computer and I enlarge to look at their faces. I don't know anything about them. I don't know what kind of life they had. I don't know if they like being at Genoa, but this is why it matters because of these girls and their descendants. And I think, you know, look at this girl here. I, I don't know, maybe she's having a bad day, but she, to me, she looks very distraught. This girl right here, she looks like either she's mad or defiant, strong, whatever. Others are smiling. These were all people and they have children and they have communities. And that's the main reason why the boarding schools matter. Okay, do we have time for questions or do we have to jump off? Okay, from the chat, it says, what are some steps that American Christianity could take to acknowledge its role in these abuses? And do you see this as a path to reconciliation? Um, you know, if I had the answers to that question, I probably would have written a book and I'd be on the lecture circuit right now. You know, it's really complicated. Um, not to be self-serving, I am doing a, like, a, a a workshop next month through Bright Divinity School addressing that very situation. But I think one place to start is to uncover the role of Christianity in colonization and start to come to grips with it. You know, for um, I'm not an anti-Christian person. I, I have deep roots in Christianity, um, deep roots in that, you know. My mother might be worried about some of the things I've said today, you know, if she were here. But so I'm not, you know, I'm very sympathetic with that. Um, taught biblical studies, all that kind of stuff, you know. The thing about Christianity is there are biblical passages and teachings and doctrines within Christianity that would have stopped all of this. But for whatever reason, the vast majority of American Christians chose to look at biblical passages and teachings and doctrines that encouraged all of this. So that kind of self-awareness, I think, is a beginning point for Christianity. But that can be a tough conversation to have. And kind of piggybacking off of that, as far as like for educators, e even in the schools below the college level, is there any recommendations? Um, and I know from my child's experience being Native American and, and growing up and having to explain during Thanksgiving is where I'm going with this. How, how, how can we 
look forward to helping in that education setting to let people know what it was like for Native Americans in a sensitive way with younger people. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's an essential question because a lot of the attitudes and um, actions that many of us grew up with and even have today started when we were kids through the kinds of stuff you were mentioning it. So I think it becomes very important to start teaching about this, you know, maybe not in this kind of detail, but, you know, to start teaching about, you know, how do we position Native Americans in this story? They weren't these brute, ignorant savages running through the forest um, that Europeans stumbled upon this open area out here and Europeans came to teach them all this. You know, we teach about their sophistication, about all of these positive things to begin to set that. And then I, I think kids can handle more than we give them. So to talk about the realities of what Europeans and Americans did, that doesn't mean everything European and everything American is bad, but it is important, I think, to teach that. There's a recent book within the last year, it's a, a children's book that came out. It's sitting on my desk. I can see it in my head, but I can't see the title. <laughs> and it is about Thanksgiving from the Wampanoag's perspective, the original people who encountered Native. If you'll email me, I can see it is a great book. If I, if I were teaching, it's for like elementary and middle school, but I'm telling you, if I was still teaching, I'd require it as a textbook. They deal with colonization, but they also, it's not just colonization, they're also showing how Wampanoag people lived, the sophistication, the respect, you know, all that positive stuff, and they balance that against, it's great. Email me, I'll, when I get home, I know where it is, it's sitting right there. Thank you so much for joining us, and let's give Dr. Langston a, a round of applause. Thank you. And um, just as a just a reminder, next Tuesday we are having stories of surviving survivance with Dr. Davina Two Bears from the Arizona State University, who will be streaming in with us. We will have lunch as well. There will be like uh, box lunch will be served on Tuesday. And on Wednesday, we are going to have a craft day in this room as well at noon as well noon as well and it's going to be to make dream catcher so please join us next week next week is the final week that the exhibit will be on display so we look forward to having you all here for this last week and if you have any questions please let us know and thank you so much for joining us if you are a student and you're here for extra credit please scan that qr code as you're leaving or if you're online the link is there in the chat have a great day everybody goodbye for now <laughs>